Hi, my name is Raymond Baltar and I'm the Biochar Project Manager for the Sonoma Ecology Center and the Director of the Sonoma Biochar Initiative. I want to thank all of the attendees uh, who've come today for your interest in biochar and for taking the time out to drop by. And I want to especially thank John Masouris and John O'Donnell for giving us the support we needed to make this a free event available to all. And also to some people who helped during the planning for this event. Um, this would include Jim Amonette, Kathleen Draper, Tom Miles, Kelpie Wilson, and Josiah Hunt. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Don Francis and Kim Jones of the Sonoma Ecology Center staff who helped out on various parts of this. Uh, and my co-host as well, Alejandro Moreno of the VenturePad co-working space in San Rafael. So the genesis of the group presentations you're about to see and hear uh, was a desire uh, to offer the compelling biochar story to those in the philanthropy and social impact communities that may not have heard it before. And hopefully to raise awareness about the impact that biochar production and use could have if implemented on a large sustainable scale. And I do want to emphasize the word sustainable. Uh, there are millions of tons of surplus biomass produced in the United States each year from forestry and ag. And a significant portion of these materials could, and in our view should, be converted sustainably to the stable and beneficial form of carbon we call biochar. We do not need to use fertile land to grow feedstocks to produce biochar, and sustainably managed forests produce an ongoing supply of usable, usable materials as well. While most of the biochar has, uh, that's been produced up to now has been uh, used uh, as an agricultural soil amendment, usually combined with compost or some other nutrients, uh, you will learn that there are many other beneficial uses for this material that have the potential to grow into huge markets, aiding in food security and land restoration, in water filtration in urban and rural environments, in building and road construction, in waste management in our cities and dairies, and much, much more. Add to this biochar's carbon, carbon sequestration value, which you will learn about in several presentations today, and biochar offers a multiple of scalable, job-creating, profit-producing benefits for society that we hope you will be inspired to support. But we are still in the early stage uh, development stage of the biochar industry, and we are looking for investments that will help this industry grow. Biochar use has been growing significantly in recent years and with the right investments in education, outreach, research and commercial enterprises, this simple form of carbon can yield huge benefits for society. Just a quick note about today's schedule, there will be no time for Q&A after each presentation, but there will be time for questions in the afternoon breakout sessions. If you haven't already, you can sign up for these on the scalingbiochar.com website and we know we are asking a lot for most of you to uh, to attend two days of presentations so we plan to post uh, the, this webinar series online on the website so you can return to see individual presentations that you may not have had time to see today or tomorrow it's important to note that we wanted to present a variety of perspectives and views on how biochar can be uh, be produced and used but neither the Sonoma Ecology Center nor the Sonoma Biochar Initiative or the California Biochar Association necessarily endorses any one approach for how biochar can be produced and used. And being included in this forum is not an endorsement of any company or project. There are many worthwhile companies, ideas and projects that we just didn't have time to include and we hope to be able to link to them and hopefully their presentations over the next few months on the scalingbiochar.com website. Oh, and for a little comic relief, we are letting presenters know that we will be uh, dinging a wine glass since we're in the wine country um, to let you know 20 minutes uh, is almost up and that you will need to wrap up. So let's start the program with a keynote from Josiah Hunt. Uh, I have known Josiah for many years and uh, he's involved in many aspects of the biochar ecosystem from helping develop the policy side of biochar industry to developing markets as head of Pacific Biochar and as a board member of the US Biochar Initiative. 
He will present the big picture view on biochar context uses and how it can play an important role in regenerative agriculture and carbon farming. Josiah. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, so yeah, I'm Josiah Hunt of Pacific Biochar. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about our company, um, we'll be having a presentation later in this conference tomorrow about leveraging biochar um, and scaling biochar in the near term. Um, today, I'd like to discuss, uh, to help open this presentation, um, to open this conference, uh, biochar context, biochar, the big picture, the view from 30,000 feet above. Uh, following me will be some of the top level scientists discussing biochar uh, characteristics in detail, as well as climate change mitigation and a myriad of wonderful uses. Um, so here I'd like to discuss kind of why we're all here. Um, I think that uh, I think that I used to I used to open a, um, presentations like this with a a series of of images of recent disasters, looking at what's going on right now in the world related to climate change that's tangible, the fires, the floods, the droughts. Um, and, and I found that during all these presentations, I find um, it's immense how many of these natural disasters are happening on a regular basis that we feel that are sapping away our luxury and making life just a little more difficult. And I think it's really important to acknowledge a difference um, in climate change as not necessarily being life or death, but luxury and the loss of luxury or luxury and suffering. And we face not just the potential for life or death, but also a loss of luxury. And that sucks. Um, and, and although it can be scary looking at the prospects that we face, I do have hope because we have so many tools that we can use right now. And I found that focusing on the things that we love, the things that we treasure in this world can provide an almost unending source of inspiration to continue working, to fight for the things that we love, to fight for the luxuries that we enjoy and to continue working towards that. And so I'd like to start this with a few of the things that I hold dear. Okay, Josiah, take it away. Thank you so much, Raymond. Yep, hello everyone, Josiah Hunt founder and CEO of Pacific Biochar Benefit Corporation. If you want to learn more about our company and what we're doing, you can check us uh, out tomorrow in the presentation about leveraging uh, infrastructure uh, for a fast scale up. Um, so this morning, I'd like to help bring in this presentation by talking about biochar in the big picture, talking about the context, kind of a big picture view of why we're all here. Um, following me will be some top level scientists discussing in very great detail characteristics and applications and climate change mitigation. So today I'd like to discuss a more broad picture view. One of the reasons I think we're all here is because of the problems we face that we've kind of created for ourselves with environmental degradation and climate change that biochar can help solve. And it can be quite scary looking at the great climate change we face. Storms of immense magnitude, fires we've never seen before, floods and droughts, and potentially immense loss of life. This is scary. And fear is an often an entry point for climate change. But I think it's important also to consider what we're fighting for. And climate change is not necessarily, as I view it, a matter of life or death, but also loss of luxury. Um, it could be also viewed as a loss of luxury and an increase of suffering. Um, to only fight from a place of fear can be 
almost debilitating after a while. It can give you an instant boost of energy, but it, it's kind of sad. It can be kind of debilitating and depressing sometimes. So I found over the years that an almost unending source is to fight for the things I love, to fight for the luxuries I enjoy the most. Those are, are worth fighting for and working for. And we can, we've got all the solutions we need. We just need to choose to use them, all of us, now. So here I'd like to present the big picture view of biochar and starting with a few luxuries I enjoy and a few things I treasure that I believe are worth fighting for. Okay, here we are. You should be able to see my presentation now. Dark Earth for a Bright Future. This is a place that I love. This is, um, this is on a small island in the Pacific. And lots of times, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have these places in our mind that we, that we imagine that we'd like to go again someday, that we picture in our mind as the, the ultimate of paradise and luxury and joy and, and vacation and, and things of that nature. And this, this for me is that place. Um, this small island will be will be basically underwater and unlivable in about 30 years. And the population that lives there today has to find an evacuation because of climate change. And because we did not get on this early enough, this will be lost. There's, there's not much we can do there. But it's beautiful and I think worth fighting for. This is my daughter, Sophia. Um, this is my son, Noah. They, um, they're going to grow up in a world where the island's gone. I was able to take my son there and it was probably the, the most enjoyable adventure I've had in my life. Um, and I want to be able to share that with, I want him to be able to share that with his kids. That, that's, that's kind of what we're fighting for. And, and sometimes it gets lost. It's, it's like, well, what are we fighting for? Oh, you know, uh, polar bears or you know some global climate change thing and for me it's personal I'm fighting for that little bit of paradise I'm fighting for the luxury that we might lose if we don't do something now I'm fighting so that my kids can grow up in a future that will hopefully be something like the wonderful world that we've known um, and that's something to feel proud about and something I look forward to um, so we today are a special generation. Well, not, not just one, the generations living today. We have the honor to decide whether by action or inaction, what our planets will be like for the next generations to come. Previous to this, we might've had the honor to decide what our village might look like, what our island might look like, what our small group might look like, but now it's global. There's so many of us that if everyone on earth started dancing, jumping up and down at the same time, we'd probably cause an earthquake or something like that. There's so many of us that our effect is global and there's only one globe, there's only one planet. So what we do, whether by action or inaction, will decide the climate for the generations to come. And that's an honor and a burden, but I like to think of the honor that we have with that. Biochar is one of the top five natural climate solutions <clears throat> for one of the top five natural climate solutions to mitigate climate change while also reversing land degradation. This has been uh, accepted and reported in the International, climate, International Panel on Climate Change in our August 2019 Special Report for Climate Change and Land. The biochar story is interesting. The word biochar didn't exist but for maybe, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago. And now it's, now it's one of the top five ways to save, to save humanity from, uh, from climate change. Um, and and how, did that, how, did this, how did this start? And I think the story of its, of its birth is important, at least to me. And, and you're gonna hear lots about the details of it, but I think 
we can talk about this for just a minute. Wim Sombrek was a world-renowned scientist, and he's he's noted as being the person responsible for our recognition of, of biochar as it is now. Many people know of, well, I mean, those in the soil science in, in world and in the biochar world might know of Wim Sombrek and, and some of what he did to help unveil the mysteries of the terra preta soils of the Amazon, which showed that additions of biochar left a lasting imprint of fertility for hundreds of years. And in this era of ubiquitously poor soil, there was these fertile pockets. And Wim helped unravel those mysteries. Well, what, what I think is also important to note is that Wim was born in 1934. 10 years after he was born, he survived through what was called the, the winter of hunger, the, the hunger winter, Dutch famine. And his family survived partly because of a fertile plot of land tended and cared for by his, by his parents and grandparents and ancestors. And so he had a very visceral and, and, and very real connection to the importance of soil fertility and human survival. It's, it's a reverence that you can only gain, I believe, through a lived experience like that. And so I, I think, and I, I think it's quite obvious here that that would have a large impact on what later became you know, his, his career in life studying soils, but also particularly with soil fertility and charcoal. I think the, the Amazon soils, the terra preta, of course, is not the only place that biochar exists and it wasn't the only place it started, but I think it's just such a perfect example of, of, of an important thing here that, that soil health is not static. Soil health is dynamic. Fertile soil can become poor, and poor soil can become fertile. And again, this has been incredibly exemplified by these terra preta soils in the Amazon. You'll probably see this picture several more times today and tomorrow. It's just a perfect, it's just, it's just a wonderful example. On the left here, you see you know, the, the standard soil, the parent material. And on the right, you see the terra preta soil, the soils that were amended by the tribes that lived there in ways that we don't exactly know. And for reasons we don't exactly know, but what we do know is one of the critical components was charcoal, which helped hold on to that fertility, allowing it to last for hundreds of years. Wim Sombrak had an idea that, <clears throat> hey guys, this is really cool. Wouldn't it be cool if we did this intentionally and on a large scale? He basically, was credited with putting, the, putting it all together and saying, guys, we've got so much biomass. We have piles of biomass so large, we call it waste. We could take some of that waste biomass and turn it into biochar and use it to improve our soils while putting carbon in the ground for hundreds to thousands of years, thus helping us improve soil fertility to directly connected to food security in a world where a lot of people that still go hungry <clears throat> and also sequestering carbon, which would be really important in helping rebalance our carbon budget here. So what is biochar? Um, well, I, I, here's just a really simplified version. I, I you know, and, and, there, and, and this deserves expanding upon, but here's just a really simplified version that's easy to walk home with. It's basically just biomass charcoal when used or found in soil. Now there's always gonna be exceptions because it's not just for soil, but what is it materially? Um, it's some biomass that if you look on the left here, there's, there's those glowing coals. It's biomass, generally woody biomass, that, that got so hot, it was glowing, emitting photons molecular changes are happening rapid at that point. And if it's able to come out of that, to go, to go from, a, from a wood chip into a glowing ember and then come out as a piece of charcoal without becoming ash, it is forever changed, it's irreversibly changed. That's biochar. And as you can see on the picture on the right, the, the pores and the, the basic structure of that material 
is, is still visible. So the body of the material kind of gets frozen in time. Biochar is not something we invented. It's been around as long as fire and plant life have coexisted. Biochar exists in soils throughout the world. Generally, we measure soil by loss on ignition, which doesn't differentiate between charcoal organic matter and other organic matter. So in this, in this pie chart, that's kind of a standard for, for looking at soil organic matter, some, some amount of that stabilized organic matter, that's biochar. It exists already. We're not just creating some novel compound that doesn't already exist. It's part of our soils, it's part of most of our soils, and it's been around for a really, really long time. What we have now is an ability to intentionally manage that portion. Where is all this gonna, biomass gonna come from? What are we talking about with this biomass? Well, we've got forest biomass, and as exemplified by the California fires recently, or the fires throughout the West, in Oregon and Washington as well. We've got some forest management concerns that need to be dealt with. So here's an example of these slash piles on the bottom of it, as it says here from this thing from the Sierra Institute, piling and, piling and subsequently burning is a common method for disposal of biomass without a material outlet. Hey guys, biochar could be a material outlet for this stuff instead of just burning it in piles. That's what we're working on, literally. Ag biomass, same thing. Here's an almond orchard, standard practice, rip out the old trees, put them in piles, burn them to ash, and then replant. We could be making biochar with that instead. And other stuff as well. Here's an example of poop. Poop being made into biochar. Biosolids from a municipal um, area being made into biochar. This is a brand new program just going out. There's a lot of things that we can turn into biochar, basically any organic matter. It's happening already. Here is a large scale facility in California where we're utilizing high fire hazard forestry residue to produce biochar in a modified biomass power plant. It's already existing. We just changed it to start making biochar. Clean emissions. Rather than burning it in the, out in the field, we're burning it in a controlled environment where we can have clean emissions and we can capture the energy that comes off when biomass becomes biochar and use that for heat and even generating electricity. We got trucks, we got fleets of trucks and equipment that are ready to utilize this material. We don't need to invent entire new pathways. We've got existing pathways to transport this biochar material. We've got compost yards, dairies, and a whole host of other facilities that can blend, improve, and then further distribute these materials. We've got vineyards and uh, not just vineyards, but we've got field trials um, in agricultural soils throughout the world that are finally coming to fruition, literally coming to fruition. It's been years of, of research that at a hurrying pace, there's more than 10,000 research articles now. And a lot of them are finally coming to an important point where we can show yield over time on a large scale. It's happening all over the world. So some of the benefits of biochar, water conservation, nutrient conservation, soil health improvement, carbon dioxide removal for many generations. Why is it not already the biggest thing? Well, there's two particular barriers, time and borders. Biochar lasts for more than a thousand years, yet it is generally valued on a two-year return when we're looking at agricultural use or many other uses. Borders. Biochar offers benefits to humanity, benefits far beyond the borders of the farm or wherever it's used, yet it is only valued for the benefits within the borders of the farm. We're not limited to those barriers, but I think it's important to recognize them so we can break through them. Time, we can finance this and profitably. If biochar is gonna provide benefit for beyond a thousand years, but it's currently only financed on a two-year return or generally valued on a two-year return, let's, let's finance this. Imagine maybe a 10-year loan or possibly a revenue sharing agreement. Borders, one of the easiest ways and most direct ways right now to value biochar beyond the border of the farm is through carbon credits. That's the first mechanism to offer reward for ecosystem services. But what about water bonds? What about possibly the insurance risk reduction? Biochar is helping reduce risk of forest fire 
of drought resiliency and food security. Maybe those could be financing tools as well. We're an industry poised to grow. You're here now. Collaboration, partnerships, and investment are critical for us to really be able to take this to the scale that the world is asking it to be. The industry is ready. There's many experts that have been working diligently for a decade or more. The world is ready. Climate change is top news and big companies are beginning to take action. And governments too, I guess. I, sh I should include that. Let's get to work. Let's fund the critical infrastructure. The International Biochar Initiative, the United States Biochar Initiative and the Sonoma Biochar Initiative should be funded far greater than they are. This is critical for us to be able to move forward quickly and safely. Please consider funding the International Biochar Initiative, the United States Biochar Initiative, or the Sonoma Biochar Initiative. They're all nonprofit organizations that would love to see your help. Partnerships, investments, and new organizations to fill in the gaps. Partner with some existing companies, invest in some of the existing companies, create new organizations to help fill in the gaps, like helping solve those two barriers that I mentioned of time and borders. With that, we can do this. Thank you take, for taking part. You can reach me at Josiah Hunt, um, josiah at pacificbiochar.com.